Okay, uh, good morning. We're ready for roll. Thank you. Do I have the Mer conference room? You do. Thank you. Ron Dittimore? Do I have Ron Dittimore's location connected? We're here. Thank you. Weather office? All right. Do I have the weather office? Weather office is here, sorry. Thank you. OSF Action Center? Uh, yes, we're here. Alex McCool? Uh, Marshall's here. Thank you. Colonel Jim Halso? We're here. DMSR? Good morning. We're on. Mike Key? Mike Key is here. Mike Leinbach? Loud and clear. John Cowart? Loud and clear. Scott Southwell? Do I have Scott Southwell connected? I do show that line connected. We will check that. Jack Kaifenheim? I'm here. Michael Fuller? Loud and clear. John Hamill? Good morning. The LCC is here. And Linda Ham. Right here. At this time, I'd just like to inform all parties that today's call is being recorded by the request of NASA. Thank you. You may begin. Hey, good morning and welcome. I uh, hope uh, the, those who got a three-day weekend had a good weekend. I know most people were, uh, were here working, though. Um, let's see. We'll start with the status from uh, Phil Engelhoff and MOD. Okay. Well, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about today, I guess, but uh, the good news is the orbiter and the crew are all doing real well. Um, right now, our crime margins have gone up to two days, four hours, and they're continuing to increase. Uh, we're working on a projection for what we think that's going to look like at end of mission, but uh, uh, as best we, we can forecast right now, um, the cryo that we're going to have left over is going to actually put us above the orbiter down weight limit uh, by end of mission. But we think it's like going to be on the order of maybe 150 pounds, Linda. And uh, if you think about a 230,000-pound orbiter, that's less than a tenth of a percent. Um, so we're proposing not to do anything right now with that other than just all good. Okay, uh, orbiter, you guys, so you think it's going to be... About 150 pounds above the 230, yeah, you may want to send a chit to the MER and let them the, evaluate. The 233 limit. I guess you're already assuming that you get to burn the homes down as far as you can for yeah. the orbit. Yeah. That's, that's the part that we, you know, short of powering up loads to try to burn off some of this extra cryo and with the heat load issues that we're wrestling with, it doesn't sound like a good idea right, right now. So um, we'd like to just watch this for a while and see what else we can okay. do. We had previously had some problems with the ergometer, uh, with the crew not being able to adjust the load in the um, auto mode, I guess. It turned out to be a switch position error, and it's been resolved. We got two of them, right? One in the mid-deck, one in the... Then we might have to use it. One in the ergometer? Yeah. Yeah. Could phone was it? Okay. Uh, the right RCS... Tank temperatures are running a little bit high. They're about two degrees above the limit right now, and we're discussing, I guess, switch, switching heater strings to, to see if we can get that to control to the lower set. Yeah. To, to, uh, uh, I, I honestly don't know. I don't know if that's a combination of attitude and heater function, or maybe we just have a, a thermostat that's controlling high. Yeah, my guys didn't tell me that one. I don't know if we're on the B heater or anybody down the MER that can. We are on the A heater. You're on the A heater, Terry? Yeah. Because of one stop aside attitude. So we can go to B if needed. Say it's because of the warm attitude? Yes. Less heater operation. That's the reason we have a high set point of B heater. Well, how, how switching to the B heater going to help you, Harry? Not because high set point, it will turn on the heater. Because right now he turns off. I thought you were violating the upper limit. No, lower, lower limit, 78 degree. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm missing, I guess I misinterpreted what I read. Okay, so we've dropped below the zot limit on the A heater, and the, the environment's keeping the A heater from coming on, so we can go to B to get the heater on. That's correct. Okay. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, I apologize. All right, I guess thanks. I read, misunderstood what I read. Uh, Everything else that I've got to talk about is uh, is the water separator uh, situation. And, uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead? Oh, wait, I think I had a question for you on the cryo. Yeah. How much bio do we have? UM plus three. And then you've got three extra cans that were earmarked, no pun intended, for the rats. Um, and uh, so I guess you got a little margin to play with there if, if you wanted to. So they're not using it? 
Uh, my understanding was that was after you've closed up the HAB, that's supposed to be allocated for, right, uh, for, them, for, for supporting them. Weather extension aid. Um, what is that if we send? Right. Is it a can a day or something? Um, I'm not sure if it's in the can a day. It's about, that's normally what they predict that's for one can a day. <laughs> okay. But it's in there for the weather extension aid. <laughs> 27 rad equivalent units. I think we've done this on another slide. You know. Okay. Um, but, but we can go look at uh, some other options for maybe using uh, residuals out of used cans to support the rats or something like that to see if we can maybe scale yeah. another can or two. But, okay. Uh, um, okay, then with the water separators, uh, I think since the last meeting, we last MMT we had, just to kind of give the short history, uh, on flight day uh, three, I believe it was, we uh, had a problem. We tried to do the condensate transfer to the CWC. We weren't getting uh, any flow. Uh, we did an inspection there. They found water um, down in the uh, in the bay under the floor, and uh, we concluded that the rotary separator, which I guess is essentially the equivalent of the orbiter hum seps, same hardware functionally. Um, appeared to have a block output. They thought perhaps it was the uh, the bellows on the collecting tank were stuck and not uh, letting the water go into the tank. They mopped up uh, an estimated two quarts of water with towels and uh, uh, switched to rotary separator two, which then appeared to work nominally, and the water did go into the tank. So we think we've absolved the uh, bellows on the collection. So what do we think was blocked? Um, if, if you can visualize the system, there are two parallel humsteps or rotary separators. Um, one run one at a time. Okay, uh, they output into a check valve, and then the output of the two systems is manifolded together into a single line that then goes into a collecting tank. Uh, rotary separator one uh, was flooding and putting free water out into the floor. So uh, when they switched to rotary separator two, it went into the tank correctly. So we believe that that absolves the bellows on the tank. And it, any, if you hypothesize blockage, it would have to be in the output leg, either at the check valve or somewhere in the plumbing prior to the common part of the line between the two. Okay. Uh, we ran on rotary separator two for another day or so. And uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, I guess about four o'clock local time here or so, we uh, we got a face-to-face -face short on the uh, on the bus. Uh, that equipment uh, stopped running. We opened circuit breakers on two phases. It appeared to be a, a B to C short to ground. Bus. The uh, HAB inverter bus, if I'm, I think that's correct. Okay. And. Uh, we looked at a couple of possible theories of either residual free water from the flooding with rotor separator one getting into some of the electronics down there. Um, the initial look at that, people have discounted that theory because of the boxes, the power generating boxes and, and trans, uh, the power equipment down there is all uh, sealed and conformally coated, so they don't believe that there's any chance that water uh, in the power system per se could have caused uh, the signature that we saw. It is possible that uh, uh, water might have gotten onto the connector uh, for the rotary separator two and caused a short internal to the connector. If that theory is correct and we didn't damage the rotary separator, it's possible that drying it out uh, could could. Uh, show that box to still be okay or that uh, rotary separator to be okay. There's also every reason to believe that rotary separator one is operable uh, if we turn it back on, but we do want to try to dry that out. And so we've developed... Why do you think it would work and not be clogged again? Uh, if you can unplug the clog, but as far as the rotating equipment, it should be okay. Right. Um, and uh, I don't know if folks have looked at the possibility of swapping ducting between the two so that you can take the output of rotary separator one down the same path that rotary separator two was pumping down. But the short-term plan was to, uh, uh, we got an IFM in work, and I think there's a meeting at 10 o'clock here local time to go over the first draft of that, to get under the boards, under the floorboards, remove the ducting that's required to get into these areas, mop up any free water with towels, 
use the DC vacuum cleaner to, to try to draw off any other residual water. Uh, for rotary separator two, they were going to disconnect the connector and try to uh, look at the terminals with, uh, with a meter to, to try to verify that there isn't an internal short within the rotary separator if we were to try to repower that. Um, and then uh, once we think we've got those boxes cleaned up and if we've ruled out any possibility of short, then with the ducts removed, go ahead and run the rotary separators for about an hour to try to, with, with no load on them, just to, to further dry them out, get airflow through them. Um, and, and that process, that, that IFM, is all still in work. In the meantime, uh, the first reaction after the loss of the second rotary separator was to take the air bypass valve uh, to to 100% uh, bypass to keep from flowing air over that uh, interchanger, the, the payload heat exchanger, I'm sorry, the cabin heat exchanger in the, in the HAB um, in order to avoid condensing more water down in that volume with no way to get rid of it. The result of that is the HAB air temperatures in the cabin have gone up as well as the, the, uh, the water loop temperatures because we've backed off on the flow through the loop. Uh, what we're trying to do to keep the cab temperatures down, and they've stabilized now at around 80 degrees. I think they peaked at about 84 degrees, and we've got them back down to 80. Right, well, they're pretty much around 76. 76 now? Yeah. Okay. Um, what we've done is uh, essentially we're, we're shunting the heat load in the cabin air back into the orbiter by... Uh, we took one of the flow proportioning valves back to interchanger to get the orbiter mid-deck air temperature cooler so that the air that we send down to the HAB is cooler. Result of that is the flight deck is pretty cool. I can't give you temperature, but subjectively the crew reported it as, as pretty cool. The mid-deck is comfortable and the HAB is on the warm side, uh, but the crew has said it's, a, it's an acceptable condition for the time being. Uh, we have gone back to flowing air over the uh, cabin heat exchanger in the HAB, basically we're running a pretty low uh, dew point in the vehicle right now. We're down around 36 degrees, I think, uh, which is pretty good. And what that allows you to do is still flow some air over the heat exchanger. Uh, since we've gotten the water temperature up above the dew point, you can put air across there without getting condensation. And the inspection that we've done under the floorboard uh, a couple of hours ago on this shift, I guess, uh, has only shown just a minimal few drops of collection down there. So, <coughs> orbiter heat exchanger. What was it in before? Both, both in payload. We swap one back to orbiter. Yeah. So one's in payload, one's in orbiter. In the interchanger, which puts more cooling in the orbiter, basically, it lets you get colder air temps going in the across orbiter. the heat exchanger in the orbiter. And then we just exchange air, and that's how we're getting the... We're, we're cooling the air in the orbiter and shipping it back to the space hab, rather than letting space hab cool the air. <coughs> okay. Uh, there, there has been one impact of that because of the, the uh, reduction in, uh, in cooling back in the hab. We do have one experiment, PCD, I believe, is, uh, is shut down, and we'd like to recover that as soon as we can. There is a temporary fix um, in work, or... or shorter, a quicker fix, I should say, in work to get under the floorboards. And this is a pre-flight approved IFM in the space hab to basically adjust some of their manual flow uh, proportioning valves. There's a, there's a collection of valves down there that they can use to adjust the amount of water flow through the racks or across the heat exchanger. And they're going to go ahead and, uh, uh, I believe, try to adjust those valves to see if they can get enough cooling back to start the CD. And this is something I'm, I was hearing that we've done before. Right. Yeah. That IFM has been on the, the books. Um, it's basically, the configuration we're in now is we're in the logistics double module mm -hmm. configuration is where we are. And, and Phil and for Kelly, uh, the Space Hub folks are caucusing on this this morning, but they feel that they can stay in this config indefinitely throughout the mission, and they're going to probably bring that forward as the preferred scenario. Right. That's what we're, we were talking about, the, to try to avoid the more com complicated ISM, if we could just position these valves to get the experiment water loop at a temperature that will support the VCD experiment, then we can carry out all our operations. And as Vanessa said, our module temps around 76, 75 degrees or so. And yesterday, when we started having the rise in temperature, uh, the crew didn't even notice when we went from 70, low 70s to like 76, 77. Two out of three crew members didn't even know the temperature changed. 
One crew member noticed it was a little warm, but they didn't think it was too uncomfortable. When do we think we're going to do this? I think the entire manual. They're looking at it now. I suspect okay. that they're reviewing the procedures, and we may be able to do it. I would expect maybe sometime on the shift, but I haven't got a timetable from them. The because the it is a public site. Is the only one that shut down? Yeah, BCD is the only one that BCD. shut down, and they, their next activity was for uh, Flight Day 7 for tomorrow. So, oh, so we got some time. We got some time, but it, like I said, published ISM, the other ISM was not published, so we had to go through all the rigors of developing the ISM, reviewing the procedures. So now we just need to... Not only that, but if you go in there and you're going to try to power something that you think is exactly. shorted, it's probably exactly. something that you really don't want to do. You have to exonerate that first, and right. there's, you know, two possible branches out of that procedure that either you do or you don't, and then might not be able to go to Okay. So we're hopeful that this is going to work and we won't have to do the more complicated. Okay, so the adjusting manual for uh, proportioning valve we think will get done sometime between today and tomorrow, which we don't even need it until we do the next VCD run, which is scheduled for tomorrow. We all think it's going to work. We think it's the only thing we're going to need to do to keep the cooling and humidity at the right levels. We hope that's the case. Right. And Linda, just so you know, we may start it, but what they're going to do is they're going to do it pretty slow. One of the valves they're going to adjust only very slightly watch it, look at it, see what kind of response we get. So it could take a while to get to the desired temp for VCD, but we may be able to at least get it going and see how the what response is. What is the desired temp for VCD? Their water temp desired is 65 degrees. And what is it now? Um, I think the water temp is in the 70s, about 5 to 10 degrees above what they want. Okay. I'm hearing 5 to 10 degrees above what you want. All right. Uh, and back on the... Uh, more elaborate ISM for cleaning up uh, the water. Uh, first, first I wanted to ask the orbiter guys, did you guys see this on your data? On the fuel cells? No, I don't, I don't think we did. Anybody down there can answer that? Or uh, Larry here? I look at the, uh, when I heard it over the loops, I look at the, uh, mainly the AC on the orbiter and, and so forth, and I, I saw, uh, I saw nothing there. Cause, you know, I heard him just talking about AC, and I used to be sure I pulled up and look at look at the orbiter AC stuff and didn't see anything. Uh, I, I believe the Eagle did see it in the HAB data and right. verified that it was a short. There was there was a short term theory that that we either maybe got some flooding that slowed the the pump down or something like that. But the current traces that he saw the electrical load exchange between the phases, he, he confirmed Right, it and, I, and I did see, see some of the data they pulled, and it definitely showed up in the HAB oh. I mean, But it didn't show up very in Very significant uh, signatures. Okay. You know, it was definitely something going on. These are three amp breakers, I guess, that it popped. It? Okay. All so the orbital breakers are three amps, and those probably are two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But they are three amp breakers, so I can't. And you said two, two of the phases, two circuit breakers popped? Popped, B and C. Okay. So, are you going to continue, though, to develop this IFM in case you need it in the future? Uh, I think so. The plan? Yeah, I think the folks are still looking at it. Right now, though, I, I suspect the emphasis is on getting the loop in a position to support BCD, but they are, we've got, you know, in addition to the HAB team, we've got the Eagle, Econ, Max folks uh, also helping since, you know, we've got some experience with the home steps and this kind of water collection. So they're all doing their part and looking at the different pieces of the IFM, but certainly right now the emphasis is trying to get the config to support BCD. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. I really don't want to repower something that we think may have shorted. So if we get around to come into that piece before we go power it, I would like to have an MMT and make sure that everybody really wants to buy into trying something like yeah, that. So I, I understand. I, I think there's it sounds like we aren't going to need to even address that, but fast, but you never know. Yeah, I, I don't think that IFM is, is supposed to be ready until at least the end of the day today and right. possibly later, but I would probably recommend continuing to develop that just for whatever future requirement might show up that you're going to need that. Okay. Uh, and in the future, if you think you're going to need it, just give me a call and we'll set up an MMT. Or we go or something that may have shared it. Okay. That's all I had. And apologies to Space Hub guys if I misrepresented anything in their equipment. I have a question on um, another uh, anomaly. I saw an anomaly report that happened even before this, and that was just the water, base hab, water, pump. I think one of the two had degraded flow. Yeah. Right. We had a water pump two was degraded flow and 
the concern there was it was degraded. It wasn't uh, severe enough to really declare it failed, but the concern was whether it could support uh, both the water-cooled experiments. We brought them online. They would have to do a real-time analysis is what I understand, so we just swapped to the alternate pump, and it's been working fine ever since. Oh, if we had to swap that? If we had to swap back, they would take a look at it to make sure it could support. Really, they I don't think they got far enough along, and maybe the, one of the HAP folks, if they looked at it in more detail, but I don't think they got far enough in the analysis before they got overcome by the rotary separator events. Right. Um, but well, we I believe it's a good pump. We just don't know if it can support BCD CM2 SIMO. And after all this, they may have more information now from what we've learned going back and looking at, right. looking at it more close. So we can go back and look. I don't want to for you guys, but I think basically right now they believe the water pump two is a, or one <laughs> is a, is still viable. But you're right; they just hadn't had time to look at that. I mean, so one is the one with degraded flow, and two is working now. And the other way around, yeah. Right. We're on one, and it's fine, and two is degraded. Right. Okay. And just VCD would be the only thing you think is impacted if we had to swap back to the other loop? Okay. That poor thing. VCD. Okay. Let's see. So, Phil, anything else? Oh, I've got one. Okay. Mark. Okay. Um, let's see. Since we last met, um, we've got three new items on our board down there, and that's uh, a problem with the 70 millimeter Hasselblad camera that's jamming. Um, also, a suspect uh, fuel cell monitoring system data cable. And the crew works on troubleshooting procedures. Went to a spare cable, and they were able to get the FCMS data. And then also a failed uh, DSR20 VTR, and, and um, they've got workarounds using the V10 and, uh, and the camcorder. Uh, additionally, what got brought up during the meeting last Friday was O2 Tank 7A heater. Uh, wasn't working in the uh, in the manual mode. It, it did work in the auto mode, and, uh, and the plan is just to uh, use the nominal plan for uh, tank usage now. Um, an update to the uh, story I gave Friday on the AC2 Phase B uh, current. Uh, the guys have got back and looked at data, more data, and um, they have seen more occurrences, which uh, they're kind of calling miniature occurrences of this thing. Uh, they're they're a half to one and a half seconds in duration. You see a drop of phase B of 0.2 to 0.3 amps, and you see a corresponding increase in, the, in phases A and C. Uh, they're occurring during periods of, of constant load. Uh, you just you see these guys happen. Um, additionally, they looked back at um, they've, they've looked at some of the data, and they looked at uh, some data from January 13th on the pad where they had a vent door run, and they also saw. I think it was vent doors eight and nine, eight and nine, and you saw a signature that was very similar to what we saw um, uh, pre-launch when we were repositioning the vent doors. Uh, they also went back and looked at the STS-109 data, and uh, their review there has not indicated that it, it occurred during STS-109. So anyway, it's um, you know obviously it's not impacting the mission in any way. Um, it's most likely. And it's in the, in that inverter, some problem in that inverter, or the wiring uh, uh, to the panels, and uh, it's just something we're gonna have to troubleshoot when we get back. Okay. Um, see, so we'll be we'll be sending some guys to support this meeting at 10 o'clock this morning. Our ECLIS, EPDC, and uh, also safety guys will be supporting this meeting more this morning at 10. Right. And Scott, you guys will have the right people there. Yes, yeah, sure. It sounds like. Uh, you guys have already addressed most of the, obviously, the concerns we had with the running the humidity separator, too, but we'll have the folks there supporting that. And we'll look at this potential landing weight issue, too. And, uh, yeah. We ought to try to think, is there anything smart we can do to get rid of the weight? And um, You're not powered down at all, right? Goopy or anything like we that? We are in a goopy. <laughs> Pardon me? We are. Why? Or... Original, I know, but <laughs> actually they are working on that. We've got uh, updated power profiles from SpaceHab, and they're taking a look at it to see just how much we have, and then we can talk about how to get rid of it. Right. You just don't want to get too much heat. Uh, you don't want to dump heat load into the cabin. Maybe if there are things we can do with external heaters that go directly into the freezer, dumping heat in. 
Yeah, right, or maybe we could power up and, I don't know, fess some more and get rid of some water. I don't know. <laughs> Folks are looking at it. We'll look at it. That's it. All right. I know you guys are looking at that debris. Yeah. Um, as everybody knows, you know, we took the hit on the somewhere on the left wing leading edge. And, um, and the photo TV guys have completed, I think, pretty much their work, although I know, I'm sure they're still reviewing their stuff. And they've given us you know, an approximate size for the debris, an approximate area for where it came from, and approximately where it hit. Um, so we are, you know, talking about doing some sort of parametric type analysis, um, and also we're talking about looking at what you can do um, in the event we really, you know, we have some damage there. Hey, just a comment. I was thinking that our flight rationale at the FRR from tank and orbiter uh, from SDS-112 was that this, I'm not sure if the area is exactly the same where the foam came from, that, but that the material properties and density of the foam wouldn't do any damage. So we ought to pull that along with the 87 data where we had some damage, pull this data from 112 or right. whatever flight it was, and make sure that, you know, we, I hope we had good flight rationale then. Yeah, and we'll look at that. And then you mentioned 87. You know, we saw some, you know, fairly significant damage in the area between uh, RCC panels 8 and 9 and main landing gear door on the bottom on, on STS-87. We did some analysis prior to STS-89. So, uh, and really, I don't think there's much we can do. So. You know, it's not really a factor during the flight because there's there ain't much we can do about it. But I, what I'm really interested in is making sure our flight rationale two flights ago was good. And maybe this is home from a different area. I'm not sure, and it may not be that can't maybe correlate it. But you can try see what we have. Okay. Else. Okay. Vanessa. Uh, Linda, from the uh, payloads perspective. Um, Spacecraft payloads are operating nominally. All their planned experiment runs have been accomplished to date. They do have uh, one payload, uh, MISTERS, which is a mini satellite threat reporting uh, system uh, demonstration. It's an Air Force payload that's been having some command and telemetry problems above that seen by everyone else. Um, the spacecraft guys are working with the Air Force to try to help them figure out what the problem is. It's a first flyer payload, so it just could be some learning curve going on there, so we're trying to help them out. Uh, also, the uh, CM2 uh, payload, we uh, did not complete two of their runs, I think, on yesterday. However, uh, the customer is very satisfied with the science, with the inputs that he's received thus far. They may not even ask to have that uh, rescheduled. Um, I'll give a quote from the code you rep. He says that uh, they're quite happy. Um, and the customers are responding well to the uh, system anomalies. Um, the VCD um, does understand that if they can't get their run today, then they could reschedule for the next, for tomorrow, then the next day. So um, they're, they're okay with what's going on there. With regards to the loss of the RDM data, uh, just to brief over the weekend, we did troubleshooting in several different uh, areas. Basically, um, it's pointing to a checksum error in the EDSMU data, and uh, when it gets to the ground, um, it's been causing the EGDA to crash. They have disabled the uh, checksum that's coming down. However, they still are having some crashes when they go from LOS to AOS. Is it less often, though? It's less often, but they're not willing, basically, to say that, you know, it's right now for the payloads, there's eight of 30 that are impacted by this. What happens is SpaceHab does a call on their data loop that says, you know, we're getting ready to have a crash, so everybody be prepared. <laughs> And everybody, they reboot the EGDA, the payloads reboot, and so it, it's a nuisance to the to the customers, but but they're they're dealing with it. Yeah. And all these data thirty payloads, do they have uh, onboard recording, or we record the data on the ground, so post mission they'll still get the data? A little both. CM2, the bigger uh, data uh, requirement, does have onboard recording, and then we do have the data recorded on the ground. So if the customers do want it. We can go and get it. They're losing about two to three minutes of data when they have but, to go. But it's all three. available. None of them have lost it permanently. Collect. All right. Um, right now, they are looking at a ground workaround that they're going to try to do once we get past the uh, ward separator <laughs> concern, where they're going to try to take the channel two data and route it to the backup EGDA and then have it go into the prime EGDA. That'll avoid crashes for channel three and the forward link and PDI. So it would only be the channel two data, and then they'll route it into the EGDA, and then and they'll get that. So right right now, they're coming up with something to minimize the overall impact. But today, everyone's living with it. And 
and they're okay. The patch is supposed to be available maybe uh, later on tonight. Uh, Freestar is um, very happy. Uh, they reported that for the first time they've gotten a visual image of an elf, elf in space, and um, they're just excited about that. Um, that's from the, the Medix payload. Um, it, it's a visual em emission from thunderstorms. Yeah, yeah. Apparently the dust storms, they hadn't seen any of them yet because there's a cyclone or something. Not yet. We're hoping the clouds will clear and we'll get to see some dust. But so far they have been getting excellent sprite and as Vanessa said, they captured the elves. So there wasn't any very dust this time of year. They well, we're, they are predicting some dust later in the week. I, I want to yeah, say they said so Wednesday. Yeah, Maybe Wednesday. Tomorrow. tomorrow they're expecting some dust. Elves so. and dust. Fred Bay works in orbiter. And uh, as Don mentioned, the uh, DSR-20, they do have a workaround for that. So um, they are getting the digital data downlink via the uh, camcorder. And they're pleased with that as well. So overall, in terms of uh, payload uh, science and operations, they're, they're very happy with the mission. All right, great. Um, FUD, Bob? No issues from the crew, Linda. Okay. Space and Life Science? Nothing to add. Is the crew getting uh, good sleep? Thanks. So. Feeling good? Yeah. Good. Uh, integration? Linda, the, uh, just a little bit more info for the community relative to the debris. Uh, it, it does, uh, our first occurrence of uh, visual evidence of the debris is later in the flight than the uh, STS-112 occurrence. Uh, the quality of the film is not such that it supports our definitive, making a definitive decision on the source. Of course, we'll look at uh, any handheld pictures once the, we get the uh, crew back, and uh, that'll help a lot. The uh, photo folks are off continuing to work, trying to uh, improve the quality of the, uh, the film that we do have. And, uh, but for a quick look analysis, uh, in terms of damage assessment, we are assuming uh, the forward bipod location as occurred on 112 and for the specific uh, Mach number regi regime uh, where we first see the debris and we are also assuming the STS-112 debris size from the bipod for damage assessment. So that data is being made available to the order orbiter and uh, the degree or the locations of damage will, uh, I I'm assuming, report in a an orbiter evaluation of whether or not there's anything unique we ought to attempt or consider for entry based on the, that kind of a worst case scenario based on the two assumptions, you know, the bipod and the size being the same. And uh, higher mock is going to be worse. Yes, but the, you know, the, the debris impact locations will be different, so that's one of the reasons we have to. Uh, right. Uh, you know, we'll basically, like you said, give a little bit of parametric set of data to the orbiter so they can uh, decide what the worst case scenario may be. Okay. That's all. Okay. Has ET been working this with you also? Well, ET is appraised of it. Uh, in terms of this damage assessment, there's not really anything that ET right. would be doing. But they may be able, I don't know, to help you on where they think it may have come from or... Well, if we get better quality, uh, you know, uh, film evidence and, of course, as in the past, the ET would like to wait for any handheld photos that we have from the crew. All right. So that's all we have. All right. Thanks, Lambert. Warren? Uh, nothing new other than uh, Friday we mentioned that there may have been a forward skirt damage that turns out not to be the case. But uh, after closer look, that uh, is the same area that was fixed from the previous damage and it's just like it was so it doesn't Good appear news. to be any damage and with the sea state you would have wondered how that happened uh, it, things were very calm doesn't get much calmer than what it was okay so no damage it's good news that was the report yesterday anyway okay shuttle processing nothing to report thank you uh, launch integration we've got nothing this morning linda Okay. Marshall Projects? Uh, we have nothing this morning, Linda. Uh, safety? Uh, nothing else, Linda.
Okay. Couldn't remember when the next MMT was going to be. So, um, looks like things are uh, humming along well here. Uh, next MMT scheduled for Friday, 8 o'clock. Unless uh, something comes up between now and then, and uh, I'm asking the MOD and the folks to uh, call me before they would implement this other IFM, um, and we'll probably have an MMT meeting if we need to do that. Thanks.